think about five or six folks have done uh, the Wikipedia. So again, just make a minor change, uh, update or something like that, and then post what you've said. Okay, so a little bit about John Henry. So that's a song, one of the songs, uh, one of over 200 versions of the song of John Henry. And it's set in a period that we've been talking about. Uh, it involves many of the people that we've been talking about, uh, but it was until relatively recently. Uh, I, that expression, I, I, I'm going to have to learn learn that, that expression. So that's that's a good that's a good thing. This goes hard. That's a good thing. Um, so that's the song of John Henry. There are over 200 versions of the song. Is it really loud? Is that what you're saying, Gabe, babe? Uh, so the song is not just a uh, folk song. There are over 200 versions of the song, but it's also one of the most famous blues songs. So one of the most famous uh, blues songs as well, sung by all these singers, Odetta, Blind Connie Williams, uh, uh, Furry Lewis, uh, Bucka White. It's a very, very popular blues song. But it's not just a famous blues song. It's also one of the most famous country songs. Oh, Henry, All right, so it's not just a country song. It's not just a blues song. Uh, it's also one of the most important bluegrass songs. And if you've ever uh, played bluegrass, um, blue, one of the first songs that you learn to play on bluegrass is John Henry. <laughs> But it's not just a famous blues song. It's not just a famous country song. It's not just a famous uh, bluegrass song. It's also one of the most important folk songs of the folk revival of the 1960s and 1970s. John Henry. Oops. John Henry was about three days old, sitting on his mammy's knee. Well, he picked up a hammer and a... Okay, so there are over 200 versions, as I said, of the song of John Henry. What is the story of John Henry? The story of John Henry, it's a famous story, relatively famous story in for people of my generation. Uh... Right. <laughs> this, uh, this song is incredibly popular, incredibly widely distributed. Uh, and here's the story. The story is that John Henry is a man, a powerful black man, who wields two 10-pound uh, hammers, 16-pound hammers, 20-pound hammers, and he can lay track all day. And so this is an image of John Henry from uh, John Henry and the Double Jointed Steam Drill from 1945. This is from James Daugherty. Daugherty who was actually a communist, um, was kicked out of the Writers Guild uh, for communist subversion, but he ends up drawing children's stories. And he was so irritated about being expelled from the Communist Party that every image that he drew for children's books, he put a hammer and a sickle uh, in it. And as you can see, if you look carefully at the top of John Henry, you can see the hammer and the sickle there. Yeah, this, the, the tune itself of John Henry is relatively similar. They, they, they do sound very similar. Uh, there are some others, uh, but it's basically what's called a black ballad. So it's got 
Um, it's, it's repetition. They did do a Disney movie about him as well. So this is from an African-American artist from the 1940s uh, to give you a sense of the sort of popularity of, of this uh, song. And, and this, so the story is he goes out to a um, building site and a steam drill comes in the building site. And the man who operates the steam drill, an engineer, uh, the fellow with a mustache in this image, uh, is says that this steam drill is more powerful than any person or group of people. And John Henry challenges the steam drill to a race. And they race all day. At the end of the day, uh, a steam drill only makes 16, uh, the, John Henry makes 16 feet. He does 16 feet of drilling. The steam drill only makes nine. Now, that's not actually what a steam drill looks like from 1944. That's actually a, um, j something like a jackhammer. An actual steam drill in the period that this probably happened, or very likely happened, is looked like this. It was an incredibly complicated piece of equipment that frequently broke down. Uh, the power was distributed not uh, pneumatically by, um, with, with uh, liquid vessels, but uh, largely by the steam itself, which compressed, and so it was an incredibly uh, inefficient way of generating power. But it did uh, rotate and percuss and, and in the 1870s and, and was capable of drilling. In any event, at the end of the day, John Henry drills 16 feet, the steam drill only makes nine, but he feels weak. And this is from another African-American artist from the 1930s. Uh, and he's, uh, he asks for a cool drink of water before he dies. At the end of the day, in the end of the song, in the end of the story, John Henry dies, having defeated the steam drill, but having made himself a kind of hero. Now, I had thought that this uh, story of John Henry was made up, entirely invented. And, um, but as a historian, uh, my, one of the first things I did after my, my first book was to sort of investigate this legend, and not because I thought he was a real person, but because my advisor told me that it would be a good idea to write something about John Henry. I just finished a book about the creation of the Southern Railway. He had shown up occasionally uh, in the sort of later versions of the telling of the Southern Railway. And um, so I decided to, to take a look at the story. I knew something about the railroad that he allegedly worked on, which was the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. And this is a railroad that initially was supposed to go from Richmond, as you see here, to the Ohio River, which is right here. And uh, it cost the state of Virginia in trying to c construct this railroad over $3 million uh, up to 1860. It never gets finished. Um, Collis Potter Huntington shows up in 1868, and he says he can build this railroad in five years, by 1873, and he will get all the way to the Ohio River. He, the, the Virginia legislature knows that the Appalachian Mountains are still in between the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad and the Ohio River, and they think it's impossible for him to do this. And so, the, but the Virginia legislature is, is happy to listen to this, and so they promise to turn over, if he does, complete a railroad that goes all the way to the Ohio River, in five years, they will give him <laughs> the railroad. Uh, yeah, 1873 is not an especially excellent time, uh, it, it turns out, to have finished a railroad. But they promise that if he gets the railroad done by 1873, that he can have all of Virginia's shares in the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad, this unfinished railroad that goes all the way through Richmond and Charlottesville and Stanton. Um, he's going to build it through the Virginia Hot Springs and the White Sulphur Springs all the way to the town that he names Huntington after himself. The problem is, of course, the, uh, the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachian Mountains at this spot between, uh, yeah, let's see, between Stanton and White Sulphur Springs, this area is the spine of the Appalachian Mountains. Over a mile high, but it's, uh, it's really, really hard rock, uh, kind of impossible to get through. It costs over a million dollars to get through the railroad near Charlottesville. And uh, the Virginia legislature is certain that he, or, or pretty persuaded that he can't do it. <laughs> right? Okay, so the song of John Henry, though, emerges sometime around, the first time we hear about it is by folklorists. And folklorists are basically history professors, or English professors, who are stuck, uh, or English professors or people who are interested in English, who are stuck in the South. And Louise Rand Bascom, who later uh, marries and becomes Louise Barrett, uh, is the first to write about the story of John Henry, and she writes it in the Journal of American Folklore, and she's basically uh, 
pop, a writer who's written short stories and things like that. She's an English teacher. She has an English degree. She writes for kind of famous magazines. And she hears about this legend of John Henry in 1909. And she publishes a little scrap that she hears about it, probably from her maid. And she says, wouldn't this be an interesting story? It's, it's peculiar that this, this story is out here about this sort of legend of John Henry. Well, a bunch of other folklorists become fascinated by this uh, story of a powerful black man uh, who may have defeated a steam drill. And so in 1915, John Lomax uh, comes across a version of the song uh, the first real stanza that literature people have in 1915 and uh, in the 1920, 25 or so, Lewis Chapel starts to investigate and he finds uh, uh, many versions of the John Henry song. Uh, another person, Guy Johnson, also starts to find versions of the song. What's peculiar about this song is it hasn't been copyrighted by 1924, but there are over 100 versions of the song. So the song is widely distributed throughout the South. And so it's, it's impossible to copyright the song, really. You can copyright your particular interpretation of it. But there are so many versions of the song spread throughout the South, sung mostly by African-American men, but also white miners, also white railroad men. Um, it's, a, it's an incredibly popular and widely distributed song that seems to have no author. And uh, it's at this point, around 1924, 1925, that folklorists really get interested. Maybe there is a real John Henry, and so they start to investigate this story. Unfortunately, by 1924, uh, this has happened. Basically the beginnings of widely distributed recorded music. This is Fiddlin' John Carson. <laughs> So that's the version by Fiddlin' John Carson. And the version by Fiddlin' John Carson uh, is recorded in 1924 in Atlanta at a Fiddler's Convention. Um, the uh, Ralph Peer is the person who does the recording with very complicated recording equipment that he brings all the way down from New York. He says that this Carson guy is pluperfect awful. He's a terrible performer. But he cuts and issues 25 copies, or no, no, 100 copies of the song, uh, sells them to a, uh, what is it, a, a basically a, 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 a sort of soda fountain store. It's a, it's a drug store. So he sells them to a drug store for um, a, you know, 10 or 15 cents a piece, uh, and he goes up back to New York. By the time he gets back to New York, the drug store uh, has telegraphed the company that Ralph Peer works for, and they say they want a thousand copies of this song. And this is the birth of recorded country music in 1924. Uh, the very f the second song ever recorded, or, or the second song that we have that's re recorded in this period, is the song of John Henry. It's it's for recorded first as a country song. So here's the problem then, if you investigate this song in 1925 and 1926, is that people start to travel through um, up, up into the mountains of Western Virginia, where allegedly this happened. Uh, if we go back for a second to this image, supposedly it's the Great Bend Tunnel or the Big Bend Tunnel on the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. So uh, folk, two different folklorists come up in 25, 1925 and 1926 and start to interview people uh, about um, what, whether this contest actually took place. The trouble is they can find nothing. There are no sources that document there being a steam drill. There are no people um, who can verify that there is a John Henry. There are a couple people uh, who say that they might have met John Henry uh, or might have seen him, but the stories contradict each other. Uh, lots of other people say that there's no nothing like this ever happened. They contact the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. The Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad says, all of our rec records were destroyed in a fire in 1925, so we'll never know for sure when this happened, but there is no John Henry. Um, and there is, there was no steam drill at the Big Bend Tunnel. Um, so both of these folklorists kind of write up the story. Hundreds of articles then after 1925 come out about the legend of John Henry. And they basically all agree that while they'd like it to, to believe that it's true, there's, there seems to be no evidence that there was a race between a man and a steam drill in 1925. The image that they give of John Henry is something that, for those of you that have been uh, in this class for a while, you would think was pretty impossible. Uh, the story they say is, is that John Henry is a man who's six feet eight, 
He has a rhinestone belt buckle, and he can command any amount of money for his labor. Uh, that he is a you know a powerful man who sang while he worked, and uh, all this stuff, as you know, uh, is was taking place right in 1860. Uh, this would have happened around 1870, 71, so right at the uh, tail end of Congressional Reconstruction. And the, the, the idea of a powerful black man commanding any amount of money uh, to do this work is impossible, uh, or very unlikely, I would say. So, but I knew a few things about this coming at, at this much, much later, uh, around late, late in the 1990s, that uh, I was a little suspicious about the whole story. First of all, Huntington. We know that Huntington incorporated the Central Pacific Railroad made a tremendous fortune uh, by basically being able to penetrate the, um, the mountains in the west. And so that's why he thought he could penetrate the mountains in the east. Uh, he does so with dynamite, as we know, we, uh, initially with nitroglycerin and then with uh, duolin and dynamite. He acquired the Chesapeake Rye Railroad in 1868. As you also remember, it's Chinese laborers who built this railroad because no one wanted to work around the bad air that was being generated from these crashing, uh, the, the crashing explosions that are taking place on the Chesapeake, on the um, Central Pacific Railroad. So the idea that black men commanding any amount of money would show up and do this work uh, is, is unlikely. Um, so uh, it's at this point um, that I knew another thing that I guess actually no one had known. And that is when I was investigating the Southern Railway, I discovered that the Southern Railway was very upset that the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad owned all the convicts in the Virginia Penitentiary between 1868 and 1874. Uh, Tom Scott was extremely upset about this. Huntington was his key rival. And um, he complained bitterly about the fact that Huntington had accessible to him all of these convicts. So. This whole story about John Henry uh, didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, I figured uh, the, the, I knew that the railroad was finished by convicts. Um, the likelihood that there was some you know, great contest between a powerful black man and a steam drill seemed to me unlikely. Um, but as I was uh, finishing this up and thinking a little bit about the sci, I remembered this document that I'd found in um, around uh, 1995. And in it, it showed that lots and lots of people had died on the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. In fact, the surgeon's report from the Virginia Penitentiary complained that uh, while 10% of the people in his power in, or in his penitentiary in 1871 uh, had died and more were dying in 1872, that it wasn't his fault that most of these people were working for the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad when they died. Um, so there was an investigation by into the this. The surgeon had to write a long report, uh, and in it he described most of the people dying of what he called consumption. Many of them dying at the Virginia Penitentiary, but he said having died uh, really weeks uh, earlier, or having gotten weakened weeks earlier on the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad and being returned in a weakened condition. Uh, so this I also knew uh, that that Huntington had done this and that there had been these convicts and that many of them had died right around the time of the construction. It didn't really say uh, much of anything. Uh, yeah, T well, consumption at, at this point might have been TB, although there's other explanations for consumption. Consumption, um, it's not until 1883 that Coke, Edward Coke, comes up with uh, the... Um, the, uh, basically the, the disease that causes tuberculosis. It's a, uh, I forget why, it's a, you know, a thing that's, that uh, in, infects your bloodstream. Uh, he defines the, the cell that's responsible for silicosis. But, uh, in, in, uh, and at that point, consumption breaks into three different things. We call consumption um, so, tuberculosis, pathysis, and silicosis. All, they're, they're now three different things because they have different sources. Pathysis comes from a dust. Silicosis comes from tiny bits of crystalline rock. Uh, I think that most of the people died of tiny bits of crystalline rock. So uh, this is the picture of my background screen when I was writing this article. I was writing the article assuming that this was just a legend and trying to talk about why it is that railway workers would sing a song about a man who worked too hard and died at the end. Uh, to set a pace. And it seemed to me sensible that people who are track lining, who are lining tracks, lots and lots of African-American men having to lift, uh, well, not lots, uh, eight to 10 African-American men all uh, moving their jacks. Let me pull up an image here. Uh, basically, all of them have to lift at the same time. 
using uh, malls and they have to move the, the, the uh, track from uh, basically half an inch or a quarter inch at a time and they use a song to set the pace and I said it made sense that the song of John Henry would be uh, uh, the song about a man fighting too hard against a steam drill and dying would would be a sensible song to sing to slow down the pace this is the pick my background screen using your background screen as a way to keep uh, involved in your work is a really good idea this is what I did for my background screen but I'm listening to a version of the song uh, by um, I'm I've forgotten now uh, who it is, but there are lots of different versions of the song. And the uh, last versions of the lines of the song are, they took John Henry to the White House and they buried him in the sand. And every locomotive comes roaring by, says there lies a steel driving man. And it's at that point that I remembered that when I was in Richmond working at the Museum of the Confederacy, that somebody at the Museum of the Confederacy told me that next to the State Virginia Penitentiary, they found uh, in that spot, next to where the old White House is, that White House is, they found 200 bodies in 1993, uh, all of them buried in, uh, in, in sand. And it's at that point that occurred to me that the song of John Henry might be not just a song about an actual contest, but might actually be a story about where the bodies are buried. And so it's at this point, this is where the old White House is, and this road here, or this little path here, uh, so this, this image, let's go back for a second, why you would have a postcard that says State Penitentiary, um, Richmond, Virginia, is a question in itself. You can imagine what you'd say on the back of it, you know, saw this place and thought of you, or uh, wish you were here, right, something like that. Uh, but big institutional buildings were a big um, thing in 1905-1906 for um, for postcards and this so this is why there are postcards of the Virginia Penitentiary from 1905 and 1906. So this is later, right? Like about 30 years later. But what happens? There was a railroad that ran along here, where that white that that uh, path is, and on the other side of it, where that cow is, is where they found the bodies, 200 of them, right next to where the old White House was. But there was a railroad running by the White House and the space between the railroad and the White House was um, was where the bodies were found. Now, uh, White House, initially, when the folklorists asked in 1924 and 25, what's the White House? They said, oh, well, that's where the president is. Um, uh, that's, that's, of course, where he was buried. But um, but this image, this this place, the state penitentiary in Virginia, was at the top of one of the seven hills of Richmond. And it was visible from a long distance away, and people called it the White House, kind of a joking context. And it's white for the same reason that the White House in, in D.C. is the White House. It was burned in a fire and painted up, covered up with white paint to, um, to, to basically cover up the brick. So this was the White House, and this is where the bodies were. And so when you start with the Virginia Penitentiary, everything falls into place. Uh, here is the state penitentiary records from the, the um, this is actually the census. And what it shows is a 19 year old black man named John Henry, who is um, shown, shown in the Richmond census, but is actually, according to the state penitentiary records, out at the Lewis Tunnel on the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. He's the first set out in a group of uh, about a dozen uh, to dig tunnels for the CNO. Uh, I got the records from these. These records, of course, are from the census. I also got the records from the Virginia Penitentiary after much begging and pleading with the Virginia Historical Society. They were covered with coal dust. And what I found was John Henry is the first person to be sent out, uh, along with these other uh, 11 folks, to dig a tunnel. And if you start with the Virginia Penitentiary and you start with uh, those records, uh, after much fighting, I got access to those records, and then I found the names of the contractors, people who sent those folks out. Using the names of the contractors, uh, including Burnham and Gordon, I was able to find the documents that no one said existed, the destroyed records of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad tunnel construction. Uh, Burnham and Gordon were, uh, it's a pretty relatively, relatively common names, but if you start with Burnham and Gordon and use uh, WorldCat, which you guys use a little bit, maybe to find primary sources, WorldCat shows you manuscript sources all over the world. And what I found was that Burnham, Gordon, Huntington, and a couple of others were mentioned in an obscure railway source called Railway Records in the Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland. 
When I went there and looked at them, they described the tunneling of the Big Bend Tunnel. And in it, it describes a burly rock drill that's brought out in 1870 and 71 to the Lewis Tunnel, which fails repeatedly again and again. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it was bizarre. I, I couldn't believe it when I actually saw these records in Cleveland. And um, what I had been led to directly was a story of John Henry. And what, the, um, what they showed was that the boiler kept failing, the drill kept failing, the, the hole is choked and your um, wheel is broke, your hammer can't go down with me. That's one of the phrases in the song. And that's exactly what happened. Um, the hole broke, the wheel was choked, they had to keep replacing the boiler again and again as it failed again and again. And it shows that they had to, what, quote unquote, double on it with hammers. They had to finish the work entirely, all that tunnel drilling, with hammers. Um, I initially, when I uh, did this, didn't have access. There were other ac uh, documents that I didn't have access to. But then when I did a kind of, after that, a kid's version with uh, of, of this story for National Geographic magazine, National Geographic was able to get uh, something that no one else had gotten, which is the images of the bones of all of these men. And what they show is that the men were, uh, the bodies were extremely disarticulated. So they were dragged uh, a fairly long distance before they were buried. So that means that the, the spine, the vertebrae were, were split apart. Many of them had crushed uh, lung, um, uh, lungs, but basically the rib cages were crushed, many from within. So the shattered lines were inside the lungs, which means that they, that they basically um, were shattered from within, likely from coughing. And so uh, it's, it's pretty clear in, in numerous of these cases uh, that, that the lungs were the things that uh, finally gave out. The, as you can imagine, the children's book, they def definitely wanted to have the pictures of the bones. I couldn't uh, use them before at any point in the, um, uh, in the, in the uh, book that I ultimately wrote about this. So the Song of John Henry, then, is transmitted by the people that I initially thought they were, which is not miners, not tunnel diggers, but track liners, these men. Uh, men who uh, were mostly black men, or roughly 100,000 of them in the American South in uh, 1900. There, were, there was one track liner for every mile of track of a railroad. So this is before major roads are accessible, uh, before we have, that's riprap, the stuff that goes under the rail, and that riprap is some crushed stone and dirt. Uh, it's now, if you look at a train now, it's all entirely crushed stone. It doesn't uh, go out of, um, uh, out of true very quickly, but it did a lot then. And so you needed one railway worker for every mile of track in the South, and there's 100,000 miles of track in the South in this period. These people are relining track almost every day. What happens is a, a car goes along and drops a little uh, handkerchief where the uh, lines are out of line, and then these men, track liners, are also called gandy dancers, move the track uh, in, back in line. And so there are songs that are sung to line track because everybody has to lift at exactly the same time with their mall so that the rail can move. So I got a gal, huh, lives on the hill, huh, she won't do it, huh, but her sister will, huh. These songs, little uh, songs, one of them is John Henry, others of them become what we call the blues. So these songs, sung by track liners between uh, 1880 and uh, 1910, are the kind of origins of the blues. There's a gap in every blues song called the Seishura, that is part of what, what constitutes the blues. And that, that gap is really uh, designed for, um, for track lining. So these little bits of songs then combine and then by 1914, 1915, they become the, the music that we call the blues, sung with a guitar. Uh, but initially just sung as a track lining tool. So the song of John Henry is a track lining tool. It's designed to get everybody moving at the same time. And I want to play you one of the first recorded versions of the song that captures um, not the, the, the version from 1924, but from a little bit later, sung by convicts, that is, is I think, the first real version of uh, the John Henry song. John Henry, John Henry.
So let me let me uh, uh, say again what they're saying. They they pay darling. Who's going to buy? Uh, sorry, um, they pay more money on the C of G, the Central of Georgia, than they do on the M and O, the Millville in Ohio. Um, the next line is, darling, who's going to buy your slippers? Who's going to glove your hand? Who's going to kiss your rosy cheeks? Who's going to be your man? That phrase, or those that those phrases, come from a song called "The Lass of Loch Royal," written in 1565 first recorded in 1565. This is the first black ballad. It combines African-American musical traditions, including uh, call and response, including uh, the sort of accidental harmonies, but uh, baked into uh, a, um, a structure that, uh, the ballad structure that is hundreds and hundreds of years old. And so this is the song and the story of John Henry, initially uh, written as a as a kind of ballad to be sung at work, that carries with it um, a much older song. This song was sung al allegedly uh, with a hundred verses in 1870 and 71, and is carried around and distributed around throughout the South through the 1880s, uh, 1890s, so that by 1908, when it's 1909, when it's discovered by Louise Rambascom, there are versions of this song all over the place, but not recorded anywhere. Uh, basically passed on by word of mouth by hundreds of these men, uh, gandy dancers, uh, track liners. It's usually extra gangs that tr that would have carried this song uh, many, many other places because extra gangs are people who are the kind of elite of these track liners, the people who are very, very good at lining track, very powerful, and um, they would have traveled over long distances if there were if there was a flood or an accident or something like that to, to reline the track. This is a job that 18, that men from the ages of, black men from the ages of 18 to 35 did. At age 35, you were too old to do this work anymore. Your back was likely to give out. In fact, um, uh, yeah, so 35 is the oldest you could possibly be and still be a track liner. Uh, the, the man in the center is a trackman who uh, was, was a person who was basically, a, uh, he's a maintenance of way uh, member. He's a person who keeps uh, these workers in line, and the way he uh, gets workers to work every day is, uh, well, in many cases, uh, it's described in the, in the Locomotive uh, magazine, is with cocaine. That cocaine is provided to workers as a way of kind of keeping them going, uh, as, as, a, as a way of kind of easing the pain of the work. Uh, many of these men would wear girdles uh, at ages 25 and 26 to deal with lumbago and other back pain that they would have. Um, but the cocaine always kept workers back, coming back every day, eventually. Um, yes, and so John Henry, I don't think, was one of those elites. John Henry was the person who's described uh, by one of the, by these uh, track liners, um, uh, eventually. So, who is John Henry? The actual John Henry was a convict. He was arrested at the age of 17. In, by 18, he is brought into the Virginia uh, <laughs> uh, penitentiary. Uh, he's initially, initially arrested for shoplifting, but then when the, um, uh, which is under one of the black codes, a criminal offense. In 1867 and 68, when the um, US passes the Civil Rights Act, uh, which is designed to protect protect African Americans from, um, from being arrested for trivial crimes, uh, they upgrade the crime again and again, uh, the judges do, initially to sh from shoplifting to larceny, then to housebreaking and larceny. Um, the fact that, that uh, if, if he committed uh, shoplifting, he couldn't have committed larceny. Um, it, larceny is a theft of anything over $10. The country store that he allegedly committed this uh, event in didn't have a single thing or even a dozen things that together added up to $10 worth of goods. Uh, but in any event, John Henry um, uh, is five feet, one and a quarter inches tall, which is the perfect height, it turns out, for drilling in tunnels. Uh, your arm had to go up and back to hit that drill again and again to do the drilling. And um, you had to, the tunnels were very, very small and shallow initially until they passed all the way through the side of a mountain. The drilling was done in little bits, and then you'd make a kind of rob, a series of eight robin's nest sized shot holes in a kind of a circular pattern. Those would be blasted by nitroglycerin. You'd clear away the rock and then you'd go in again. And so the, the slow part of the whole process was not so much clearing the rock as initially putting in the holes for the drilling. That's the thing that the steam rule was supposed to do, but which was proved in the Lewis Tunnel, 
uh, the most difficult tunnel on the CNO Railroad, uh, to have to be done by convicts. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so this song is transmitted to um, among track liners. This is a juke joint um, in the 19 uh, teens. A juke joint was a place where, uh, and this is called Gandhi Dancer's Gal. It's a painting by an African-American painter in Cleveland uh, around 1918, 1919. And uh, the juke joint was a place where uh, black men came together, they bunked, they drank, and they sang songs together. And this uh, juke, uh, juke joint was a place also where, um, you know, uh, all sorts of other meetings would, would uh, happen. Um, it's by 1924, 1925 that juke joints, um, that, the, that the live singer is replaced by something called a juke box. Uh, the juke box, which goes into a juke joint, is something that has recorded music in it. And by 1924, 1925, the individual music musician who would have a guitar or something like that is replaced by the jukebox. And the, so the song of John Henry becomes the dozen or so source songs of the song of John Henry then travel. But at the same time, there are lots of people who know this song. And the people who know the song who don't know the jukeboxes are primarily convicts. Convicts who've been arrested and in the penitentiary for five, six, seven years in the 1920s have never heard the recorded song. They have many, many more versions of the song. Uh, and it's these people also that carry the song on. One of the first descriptions we have of someone singing John Henry is actually in a jail in um, Western Virginia uh, around 1909 or 1910. And uh, it's a person in a jail who's singing the song to others. Somebody passes them a banjo. But over time, as the, the steam drill became more and more powerful, as it's replaced by pneumatic drills and other drills, the idea of defeating a steam drill seems impossible. Any two of us, you and I, uh, could have defeated a steam drill in 1870 or 1871, as John Henry did. Uh, but in, in, uh, it seemed by as early as 1910 impossible to defeat a steam drill. And so this is where we get Fred Becker's image. Fred Becker's, um, I think, an African-American artist uh, from 1930s. And as you see here, uh, John Henry has got double jointed fingers. The, one of the things that you sh shows up in the folklore is that John Henry was double jointed, which is why he was so powerful. Um, there's something called a double jointed articulated steam drill that emerges right around 1910. That's probably the source of this sort of lore about a powerful man. So where a, an otherwise somewhat powerful man becomes an increasingly impossibly powerful man as a song of John Henry is transmitted and retransmitted uh, throughout the South, so that um, by the 1920s and 1930s, it becomes impossible to imagine anyone uh, defeating a stream drill who's not as powerful as this. Um, okay, uh, briefly, uh, something about the visual vocabulary. It's Hugo Gellert in 1914 that starts to redraw um, human forms with uh, a litho pencil, which is becoming widely distributed and used for handbills and things like that, in around 1914 and 1915. And he has a kind of American interpretation of what's called, um, oh, sorry, it's hard to see that, isn't it? Uh, let me do this right. Does that help? No, it doesn't help. Ah, okay, in any event. Um, he's the he's the person here on the left. And in 1914 and 1938, he experiments with this Lisso pencil and creates the American ter interpretation of what's called the Vienna Secession style. And what he does is he makes uh, he takes people and he uses their bends of them, uh, making them, them into a series of balloons or circles. Uh, these balloons or circles or um, ovals, um, they they kind of violate. Um, the, the human anatomy. He starts with human anatomy and then makes them into these impossibly strong figures. Um, they're used by the Communist Party in the 1920s and 30s, who become, in the teens and 20s, who become obsessed with John Henry. They see John Henry as a symbol of the collapse of American com capitalism. They see John Henry as uh, a kind of story about a group of people, a, a single person trying to fight against the capitalist machine and failing and evidence that workers have to come together. Uh, they're also obsessed by African-American men. They see African-American men as being the sort of perfect embodiment of the communist ideal from 1920 or so um, through the 1930s. This visual style that Hugo Gellert uh, creates is then copied in the 1930s 
uh, by a whole series of folks who are influenced in some ways by the Communist Party, although none of them are communists. Uh, this includes Joe Schuster, who creates Superman, Jack Kirby, who creates Captain America, and Max Elkin, who creates Stormy Foster, someone who uh, didn't quite make it into the, uh, um, the final list of comic book characters. But what we see is by the 1920s, by the 1938 and forward, um, as World War I starts to emerge and as a kind of an American superhero is formed, the legend of John Henry and the kind of visual vocabulary of this strongman gets converted into what we call um, the Superman. The, the, no longer the steel driving band, but the Man of Steel. And so, the song of John Henry is a song that's not about the triumph of humans over technology, although uh, that becomes the, the lesson that the blues musicians who refuse to use electric guitars, that the folk musicians who refuse to use electrical music, that um, the country stars who use banjos rather than modern instruments, uh, the textile workers who um, are faced with um, being replaced by new machines, they take on this image of John Henry as a kind of one of them, as an everyman who's fighting against um, new technologies. Uh, but in fact, the uh, story of John Henry is an uglier story than that. It's a story about one of the first major industrial accidents of uh, the largest industrial accident of the 19th century, in which over 200 uh, mostly black men who were convicts were forced again and again into a tunnel to build a tunnel that would connect Virginia with the rest of the South. They, they, uh, right. Uh, oh, you, this, you, you've heard about the kind of famous, probably, uh, legend of, of uh, what is his name? Um, uh, uh, my goodness. Well, in any event, folk music, musicians still uh, who, who resent um, uh, the this, this, this sort of modern version of John Henry, uh, who resent modern technology, are still kind of clinging to this sort of story. But what it's actually a story about is it's one that's passed on by, initially by railroad workers who are aware of the many deaths that are unrecorded and made invisible by the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. All these people are buried in the sand next to the old White House. Uh, almost everyone who participated in the construction of the Lewis Tunnel died. Not just the workers, but also the contractors, also um, the engineers, also the water boys, all of them faced this tiny bits of microscopic dust that they inhaled um, while in, in the midst of the explosions that were generated. Those tiny bits of microscopic dust are, in, 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 uh, are sucked into your air, uh, into your lungs. Um, they're two to five microns wide. So they're tiny bits of crystalline rock. When they get inside, uh, the microphages in your lungs rush to the site to try to di digest um, the rock. So if you've ever, um, for example, snorted, um, oh, um, grated cheese, like, I don't know, as one would, right? You're at a Howard Johnson's, you're 16 years old, your friends uh, persuade you to snort um, uh, the, uh, the grated cheese that's on the table. This is something that I did when I was 16. In any event, when you do this uh, stupid thing, your the microphages rush to the site and they, they eat up over time the, bit, the little bits of, of uh, grated cheese and over time your lungs uh, clear up. But the microphages can't do that with tiny bits of crystalline rock and they basically die and they fill up your lungs and eventually kill you. And this is silicosis. And this is one of the things... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things that happens uh, to all of, uh, to, uh, is likely the, the biggest killer for all of those folks is inhaling tiny bits of crystalline rock. Uh, I shouldn't make a joke of it, but it's, but it's important to sort of understand the physiological uh, character. So you don't really realize at the time, once you've inhaled these tiny bits of crystalline rock, that they are going to kill you. But it takes, over time, your lungs get more and more filled with fluid until uh, you basically cough yourself to death which is why uh, all of these workers die. So it was a story that was covered up by the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. The competing railroads of Pennsylvania and others didn't know anything about it. It was a song that was only sort of stubbornly sung by African-American track liners, uh, people who had knew about this event secondhand, who carried the song along. And even the scrap and scraps of the song actually point us back to the original site. 
point us to the place where the bodies that were buried, point us to the place where John Henry came from. Thanks. <laughs> Do people have questions? I think it was actually, now that I think of it, it was a Pizza Hut where I uh, snorted that uh, uh, cheese, but yeah, it's, which also doesn't exist anymore, I don't think. No, there's one in Athens. All right, other questions about John Henry? couple of things about this story. So I, I um, wrote this book called Steel Driving Man about the legend of John Henry around 2004. Um, and uh, it was at this point, it, when I wrote it, I initially sent it to um, Bruce Springsteen. And because um, I knew that he had just done a version of the song, uh, John Henry. And I sent him the proofs and I sent him the man, I sent him the manuscript, I sent him the proofs. I sent him the um, uh, the hardcover when it came out and shortly after it came out uh, on hardcover I was I was it was the book was in the New York Times I was on the front page of the New York Times the next day I uh, Oxford University Press University Press got a call from Bruce Springsteen's um, legal firm said that they were prepared to endorse our product and so Bruce Springsteen actually wrote a blurb for the paperback version of this book and he invited me backstage uh to meet him and when he gave a concert in richmond virginia um so he was of course fascinated by the st uh, story of john henry um but I, I am the only historian who's ever gotten a blurb from bruce springsteen bruce springsteen has never endorsed anything in his life before uh, not even the guitar and so the contract that oxford university press had to uh sign to get uh, that endorsement was um uh, over 20 pages long but uh so anyway so that's the story of john henry and it's a story of um, the ways in which um, this sort of horrible tragedy became a folk song and was transmitted throughout the South over the period of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. Thanks so much. See you guys on Wednesday.